Matthew chapter 26 this morning. I hope to be preaching uh, this morning and the uh, next few weeks leading up to the uh, Easter season and through the Easter season and that time on some of the events of uh, those days of Jesus on this earth, uh, that he would go to the, the cross and uh, his crucifixion and his resurrection. Uh, what an important uh, time it was in not only the life of Christ, but uh, in the life of believers and really a, a pivotal point for all things because the resurrection makes the difference uh, for us as believers and uh, separates us from uh, all other cults, faiths, and isms. It's because we serve a risen Savior and one who is out of a tomb, and uh, we're thankful for that this day. But today we're going to look at uh, one of the subjects that, uh, uh, and again, a number of offshoots of things that you can look at and study, but looking at the, the Last Supper and betrayal of Christ today and uh, the characters involved and some of the things that went on, and I pray it'll be a blessing and an encouragement to us and if nothing else, help us to get to, to think along the lines of what our Lord endured as he began to make his journey. And of course, we separate some of these things and study them out. But again, once these events started, it was just a continual process until that time of crucifixion, his death and burial, and then three days later, his glorious resurrection. But Matthew 26 this morning, and uh, we'll read in verse, uh, begin in verse 1 and read and uh, then we'll uh, read a uh, skip down and read another passage and it came to pass when jesus had finished all those sayings he said unto his disciples you know that after two days is the feast of the passover and the son of man is betrayed to be crucified then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called caiaphas and consulted that they might take jesus by subtility and kill him but they said not on the feast day lest there be an uproar among the people. We're going to skip down to verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they coveted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where will thou that we would prepare for thee to eat the Passover. And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave it, unto the, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And then when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And so we uh, read of the account of uh, the last, the Lord's Supper, as we would say, uh, as it was instituted, the Last Supper, as we see uh, the event that's before us, but also uh, the betrayal of Christ all mingled within that. Let us uh, ask the Lord's blessing upon his uh, word this morning and pray for the service. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the day and for the time we can gather. Thankful for, uh, again, just an opportunity to be in your house. Lord, I ask that you might now just bless the preaching of your word, that you might help me that you might fill me with the power of your spirit. Help me to preach those things you've laid on my heart. And Father, may be an encouragement to each and every one here. May we see again the things that were uh, that took place uh, leading up to the crucifixion. And uh, just again, Father, may it uh, 
and turn our hearts unto you as we think on those things. We ask that you might, again, just be with the kids' class in the back, just bless and encourage there and help them to learn more about you this day is our prayer. And Father, we ask for your blessing upon this time, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. But the uh, account was given, and when Jesus came and he told his disciples, and know that he knew everything that was going to take place. And he simply told them, he said, in two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. In another place, uh, you'll find that he had told them uh, that, uh, again, his time had come unto him. And, uh, and he says, uh, the Master saith, my time is at hand, in verse 18. You'll see and find in some other places where he mentions his hour. And again, he speaks of that. Jesus knows those things that are coming to him. He knows what he is about to have to endure. But as he gathers his disciples together and he begins to tell them what is going to take place. And he says, we need a place to eat of the Passover that Judas has already left. Uh, and Judas would be one of the 12. And we'll speak of him here in a little bit. But he goes and he covets with a high priest and uh, and consults with them. And he says, what will you give me that I might betray him? And they uh, came together with a price, interestingly enough, of 30 pieces of silver and a uh, price of a slave, if you look that up, but also a fulfillment of prophecy. And we'll uh, possibly read those passages here in a little bit, uh, if time permits. But Judas uh, would begin the uh, acts of what he was going to do to find a time that he could successfully betray Christ and sort of away from the crowd because, uh, again, the feast going on, the Passover, the Jews would have been in an uproar. And so uh, the, the, they were doing this sort of on a little bit of a uh, sort of the lowdown, just trying to keep it uh, from the public eye. And again, they didn't want to do all those things. So Judas was preparing in his mind a time of what he would do, but he had been paid for the deed of betraying Christ. They would uh, come to eat the Passover and uh, interestingly enough, you know, some man had a room prepared for him because Jesus was going to need it. Uh, that's an interesting thought within that. Uh, he just had a room. He had it. He was going to yield it to him, maybe not knowing who they were, but God had already moved, already prepared those things. The Lord said, it's ready. All you got to do is just go tell this man we need his room to eat the Passover. Somewhere there in the city, there was a man with a house, had an upper room. And these men and the disciples and Jesus would make ready the Passover. Interestingly enough, our Sunday school lesson dealt with some of that as we talked about the Ten Commandments, the second one. But uh, the illustration using the, the Passover and the institution and the tenth plague on the nation of Egypt and the Jews still keeping that particular ceremony as they were commanded to do showing of the eating of the Passover, the moving out of Egypt and how God that would deliver them out of the land of Egypt and taking of that uh, lamb and slaying that and again, eating it as the, they were commanded to do and that memorial that was given to them that they might remember that night in which their people were delivered from the nation of Israel. And again, the striking of the doorpost and the blood on that and God passing over them and protecting them through that shed blood. Little did the children of Israel all around this time and the Jews who would be partaking of that particular meal know exactly the significance of it at this point in time in which Jesus would take of a Passover meal with his disciples at that same time. And the first thing we actually think upon and look at that is that particular meal. And the fact that um, the Passover was given, and again, uh, just a memorial to the Jews, they were to remember that, to remember that event, that Jesus would take his uh, apostles and he said, we're going to eat this together. And they would come together, and we affectionately know this particular time, we call it the Last Supper, because it would again be the last meal he would have with them. And they would gather together, and most people draw in picture of their mind that painting that was done, and obviously you see them all sitting at the table, Jesus in the middle, and not that they knew what they looked like or anything there, so take that for what it's worth. Uh, you can't base it on those paintings that come out of those ages or anything about that. But again, they sat around in an upper room uh, in a particular place and a room that this man had and at a table and all of them would eat and partake of the Passover that was prepared. And it would be just as the Jews were accustomed to doing and that these men had probably done many times before and that they had kept that. But what made this one a little different? And even the time of the Passover, uh, interestingly enough, that there would be a, a couple of Passovers this particular week, because I think that Jesus, when he is slain the next day, and you study that, there would be a, he would be slain during the time of the killing of the Passover lambs. 
And he would actually, as he would cry out from Calvary, I believe all of that would coincide with God's plan to fulfill the picture and the types. But this meal that they're partaking, if we went back to Exodus 12 and all that was instituted there, again, it was given that the Jews might remember that God applied the blood or when they applied the blood of the lamb to the door, that God passed over them and that the substitute of the lamb was given for them <coughs> that protection might come and that again, death might not come to their house. And so as they partake it here, remembering of those things, they're sitting there with the Savior and Jesus Christ in the room with them partaking of the Passover. What an incredible moment when you look back in time that that would have had to have been. But among that group and in that crowd, we would look at uh, not only the meal that they would eat, the Passover, the lamb, and <clears throat> the bitter herbs, the things that would go with it. But we look at the men that were there and the 12, as we mentioned, were there, but two of them sort of stand out. And if you continue reading, one, we're not going to look at his narrative uh, today, but it's interesting as Jesus began to discuss the betrayal with them. And he's discussing that among those 12 that are sitting there. And many of them started asking, well, they would have in the dialogue, if you read, as a matter of fact, you can find uh, the particular accounts of the betrayal. Uh, all four of the gospels speak of it. And you can find it in Matthew 26 here, Mark or Luke Mark 14, I guess let me get it all together here. Luke 22, John 18 and verse thir and chapter 13, both of them speak a little bit about the betrayal and do that. So you can find it recorded uh, in different events all through uh, the four gospels, but Matthew and Mark and Luke give a little more detail concerning some of the particular events. But we have Peter rise up and as they begin to discuss betraying Christ, and all of them, one after another, would say, is it I, Master, is it I? But Peter says, I'll never betray you. And we find that uh, the Lord is very pointed with him and tells him that before the night is out, and it's already evening time, and he said, before this night's over, you're going to, uh, before the cock crow in the morning, you're going to deny me thrice. And what pointed words that the Lord would give unto Peter. And of course, you see a real contrast between him and Judas even uh, subtly ask him at one point, and looks at him, and Judas already convening with uh, and con comprise, uh, uh, again consulting with the high priest and already uh, sort of having a plan in motion to betray him. And Judas, Judas even looks at the Lord and says, Master, is it I? And uh, Jesus said it would be one that he would dip the sop with, one that would take of him. So the men that were here, uh, a couple of them stand out. And you have some words that the other were spoken uh, and again, you have those dialogues contained in the different passages. But Peter, one that's interesting because the Lord would again specifically spell out his betrayal of Christ, but his would being a little different than the betrayal of Judas. Peter would deny Christ might be a little better word of putting what we have because that's what the Lord said it would. And Peter, we actually find, will go out and after he does that, he will warm his hands by the fire after they take Jesus away. After all the disciples scatter that night, he'll be right there with them. He'll curse. He'll deny that he was even with them, that he was one of them uh, after somebody had identified him there. And Peter will go out, he'll wept bitterly, and he'll eventually uh, turn his life around and he'll serve the Lord greatly. Judas, on the other hand, who we focus a little more on here in a moment, uh, Judas and his account will be quite different. But we find uh, within that that we have a meal, we have those men that are sitting there. And then I wanted to focus on another thing because I found it uh, all very interesting that the memory of this meal was to be uh, immortalized for time to come. And it was interesting that you almost see a, a moving of things from the Jews taking in the Passover and what it meant to them, and they still take of that, and they should. It was a deliverance of their people as they celebrate a number of those things God did for them. But now we have the church being called upon to remember something that was to take place, and that was Jesus sharing in this meal tonight as he passed the cup and as he passed the bread, and he said, take eat, and he said, this is my body. Now, some would say, well, they, he was literally saying that that became his body, and uh, I don't think scripture bears that out. I think obviously it's symbolic of that, that Jesus is not turning that into a literal sense, literal blood, uh, his literal uh, body as they're taking of that. Some who uh, make this passage to say some of those things, uh, I think they're very off on that. And again, we've got some other things that we could take time and study that out. 
But again, Jesus, when he's giving that, is he saying this is representing those things that are, that are about to take place. But it becomes a memorial to somewhat that we partake of even still today as one of the ordinances of the New Testament church is to partake of the Lord's Supper. And when we take of that, we, we really are just reminding ourselves of what was to come. Or actually, they were looking at what was to come in just a few moments. We look back on what took place and that the body that was broken and the blood that was shed and what it provided by for us. And again, just as the Israelites were to, in the Old Testament, be prepared for uh, service and to be prepared to leave that night, we're to look for the Lord's coming as we take of the Lord's Supper to be ready to serve and literally have our uh, shoes on and our uh, clothing on that we might be prepared to serve him till he comes. But I thought, what an interesting transition. And you see it begin here that we leave literally the Old Testament and we take on the New Testament because Jesus Christ being the testator that would soon die the, to complete that transaction on the cross where the old would move into the new, we have a new meal of remembrance, if you would, and that being the Lord's Supper that we take of today. And so the memory of that, and we can read about that because Jesus would tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, or uh, Paul actually writing to us, but those things that took place, and he said, for which I received in chapter 11 and verse 23, and I read this passage when we take of the Lord's Supper, and he says, for I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death. Till he come. And so we're to remember something new almost as we were given at the Lord's Supper, something that at this last supper would become the Lord's Supper and the church was to remember those things and remember the sacrifice that was made there, the atonement that was given, the substitute that would come. As Jesus said, my body and my blood are about to be offered for the sins of the world and as he was given those things and so the memory that's given here of these things is something that again and we even hold precious today as we partake of the lord's table and are reminded of those particular things that our savior would give of those things that he had his body and his blood that you and i might have life much like the jews were to be reminded of the passover and the passover and the blood protecting them Oh, the blood protects us today. If you've trusted in Christ and know him as your savior and you believed upon him, it was his blood and the shedding of that blood that gives us remission of sins. And as believers, it's really the power that we have that powers us to have victory over death, victory over the grave, a home in heaven. And it's all because of what Jesus did and the substitute he became. And we memorialize that in the Lord's Supper one of the ordinances of the New Testament church, the other being believers' baptism, recognizing that we are and identifying with Christ and then celebrating in the table of Christ, reminding us of what was done for us. This do in remembrance of me, as Paul writes. So the memory of this event would stay with that. But let us focus a little more on what took place. You know, the Lord for some three and a half years, and he had chosen the men who would follow him and obviously to fulfill scripture i know there's a lot of things and questions maybe about uh well why why judas because the lord would even say i chose 12 of you and one of you was a devil and he would choose judas and judas would be uh considered i entitled my next point the man of sin because uh i was going with ems and it sort of fit the man of sin is a title given to the antichrist but i think judas wears it well as also uh, because he uh, would have Satan within him at this point that he comes in. And I'll read you a couple of those passages. John chapter 6 and verse 70. Jesus would speak concerning his, his choice again and concerning who Judas was and at the time. And all the disciples when or the apostles, when they would write their narratives of the gospel, would speak concerning the things. And when Judas was mentioned so often, they would mention him as the one who betrayed in John chapter 6 and verse 70, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, 
for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. You know, Judas has always uh, uh, puzzled me in some ways. Judas was one of those who, when you think what he's seen, and by that simply meaning he followed our Lord uh, for three and a half years, uh, he's seen the blind be made to see. He's seen the dead rise again. He would have traveled with Jesus. He's seen him pray. He's seen him touch folks. The woman who uh, had the issue of blood to be healed. He's seen, uh, again, the demoniac of Gadara and the others who Jesus put to his right mind. He's seen the waves calmed as they were rowing in the boat across the sea and Jesus come walking on the water, still the storm. He's seen all those things that he's seen. The feeding of the 5,000 the feeding of the uh, other groups on the, the mountainside, and even with the leftovers and the baskets. At one time, 12 baskets left over. There was 12 of them. I think they all carried one away somewhere, home or with themselves. The evidence of what Judas visualized and seen, and yet a heart that never came to know the redemption that was in what Jesus would do on the cross of Calvary, a heart that would stay cold, a heart that would uh, again have a head knowledge of Christ, but never truly submit and surrender to him in his heart. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 3, the Bible tells us, it said, Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and commun communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and coveted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. That was the mission that Judas was on. And he had done that before the events of the Last Supper. And again, as we said, 30 pieces of silver. An interesting choice. Uh, again, the price of a, a slave or uh, one who would uh, uh, be purchased at that time. And uh, so another interesting choice, but also a fulfillment of Scripture, Zechariah. In the Old Testament, and matter of fact, we've got a couple of references in the Old Testament to these particular amounts. Zechariah chapter 11 and verses 12 and 13. And it says, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at the that I was, excuse me, I was prized at the, them, and I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. And Zechariah prophesied concerning the price that would be paid for our Lord, 30 pieces of silver. So Judas had received that payment and he had done those things. He would become that man of sin to the 12 because Satan would enter into him and would use him to be the one who would betray Jesus. So as we uh, see these events beginning to unfold, I want to focus the rest of our time and look upon and think on Judas and how his end would be and his really his mark of betrayal. You know, it's interesting how some things get sort of passed around and passed down. And obviously Judas, uh, you know, a number of people know Judas by name. They know him as a betrayer. They know him as a a deceiver and one who uh, just again when somebody even the world sometimes can pop off they know very little about their Bible but they'll pop off with some names and things like that Judas is one that comes up they know enough about Judas to know that he lied to know that he was a thief to know that he was a betrayer a backstabber however the world might envision him but it's interesting he's one of those names that seems to have some knowledge for even some people who don't have a lot of Bible. They know the name of Judas. And Judas, even his kiss and how he would betray Christ, that's what he told the chief priest and those who would come with uh, to take the Lord. It says, Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whosoever I shall kiss, that same is he, hold him fast. This would actually take place in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus would leave with the eleven that were left, and they would go uh, walking from uh, the place of the Last Supper unto the garden. It was nighttime, and Jesus would take him. He said, sit here and pray. I'm going to go a little yonder. And he would take Peter, James, and John a little further. Then he would ask them to pray. And he said, I'm going to go a little further than them. And we know from the narratives in the Scripture that Jesus would pray. And for great lengths of time, pray for an hour and then come back. And at one time, uh, Luke tells us that 
His blood became of, of great drops of blood. The agony that was there as he would pray to the Father and actually praying that the cup would pass from him. Not that he could avoid Calvary, but he was praying if there was any other way because again of what would happen between his relationship with him and his Father when he became sin. I think again it was all the all consuming when he talked about that cup and he talked about that passing from him. His prayer looking forward to those things to come in just a few short hours from this time. And so at nighttime, all of a sudden, the mob would come. And they would come with swords and staves, as I said, and they would come preparing to take Jesus. Jesus himself being unarmed. Interestingly enough, he had told them to take some swords. They packed a couple. Uh, Peter would jump in there and think, oh, this is time. Lord's going to you know, set up that kingdom that they had been talking about. We're ready to rumble. And he pulls out his sword. He chops a... I don't think he was aiming for the ear as a good shot if he was. I think that dude ducked pretty quick, but he cuts off the ear of one of the servants. Jesus puts it back on. Can you imagine Judas even being there? You're about to turn over this man. You're about to finish the betrayal of this man who heals the ear right in front of him. And he tells Peter that this is not the way. These things have to be fulfilled and that this is going to be done. And so they put their swords away. And Peter backs down. As a matter of fact, all those men kneel even when he says who he is. As he says, I am he. And he uses that great I am title that we find in the Old Testament. And Jesus says they come again to take him and betray him. And Judas signifies with a kiss and the mark of the betrayer. And he says, this is the one, hold him fast. And Jesus will be taken to the house of, of Pilate and to Caiaphas and those others as he goes through the night and then awful, the tortures and the things that begin to happen. But the mark of the betrayal, it begins with that kiss. But Judas, as we uh, think on him a little more, and we think of what would happen, he becomes an interesting subject in the Bible because we see a few other things given about him. You know, Judas would come, and he would all of a sudden, for whatever reason, after he had done this and he had committed the betrayal, he had bargained with them, he had accepted the money that they had given and he had betrayed Christ, he then all of a sudden feels bad about it. And Judas comes into the high priest, and he comes back, and Matthew 27 records uh, those particular events. And again, after all that had happened to Jesus and all the things that was coming, and, G and Judas would come in, and it said in chapter 27 and verse 1, when the morning was come, now Jesus still uh, in the custody of all, and all that is about to go on with him, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And again, he would be wrongly tried and all that they would do. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, when he had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders. You know, it's interesting here. You see that word repentance and that is a turn of heart. But notice all that Judas is giving back and all that he is repenting to and all that he is repenting of. And he was doing that to these men here. He was coming and confessing before them. We never see him coming before Christ, confessing Christ. We never see him in a place of acknowledging who his Lord and Savior were. We see him coming before these men and he says that he, he's hated that he did this now. He gives them their 30 pieces of silver back. And it says that he brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I betrayed the innocent blood. He seen that Jesus was innocent. He admitted that. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and brought them and bought with them the potter's field to bury the strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. It was a fulfillment of prophecy. You can read that in verse 9. It says that Jeremiah spoke of the 30 pieces of silver and again the uh, condemnation that would come with that. And it said that the children of Israel would value that. And it speaks again of another prophecy fulfilled. But Judas came again with a head knowledge, not a heart knowledge. James tells us that even the devils believe on Christ. 
And even they see some things about that. And yet, it doesn't translate to, again, him surrendering his heart. All that Judah seen, all that he did, all that he had before him, the Savior walking among him, and yet Jesus revealed before him, and Judas never trusting in him, never believing on him. He comes with a worldly sorrow and a worldly confession unto the high priest, but never done to the Lord of lords and King of kings, bowing his heart and mind and trusting in Jesus as his Savior. Judas missed it all. He missed uh, the meaning of the Passover uh, with the Jews. He missed uh, the meaning and the institution of the meal that was to become the Lord's Supper. And Jesus say, and take eat, this is going to be the, the body. And take drink, this is going to be my blood. This is what I'm about to do. He missed all of that as Jesus taught him that with the time they walked with him. And he missed the miracles and the things that Jesus did to show the Jews that he was God and to show that his power was coming into this world and that eventually he would be that sacrificial lamb fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies and that he was that Messiah to come. He missed all that he told him that he was the resurrection and the life. Judas missed all of that. He had it here, but not here. Oh, that we might learn some things from that man Judas. And oh, that Judas might be memorialized as much as he is in Scripture, but to realize that there's men today that still have a heart like Judas. May we do our best to reach them. And may they come to Christ and know Him before it's everlasting too late. The betrayal of Christ, betrayed by one of His own, and the memory of the things that were to come Interesting thoughts as we head toward the cross of Calvary from a, the time of the supper taking place in the evening to the next afternoon when Jesus would hang in the balance for all mankind and he would make that substitution for you and I and he would become that Passover lamb that was spoke of in the Old Testament, that one that we celebrate in remembrance at the table of the Lord looking back for the blood that was shed, the body that was broken in our place. And I pray today that you know Him in your heart, having trusted Him and received the forgiveness that Jesus offers. A home in heaven is ours because of what Jesus did, not because of the things of this world. Judas never found that. He had much given to him, but yet never finding a place to serve the Lord. I pray that we know Him today and we take that wonderful message of the truth, the mercy and grace of God, unto all the world and all that we meet. May we tell of Christ and what He did. The beginning, if it is, and Jesus, actually I guess it's hard to define the beginning, but the events that begin to lead to the what Jesus came to do and the cross of Calvary, they sort of begin to take place here with the Last Supper and the betrayal, and again, all that would follow after that, of Jesus' torment and His crucifixion, His burial and His resurrection. But it makes us who we are as Christians and believers in Christ. Let us stand today with our heads bowed. Do you know Him? Have you thought on Him and who Jesus is and what He did for us? May we know Him today.